So, today is not St. Patrick's Day. I know that. <laughs> but Thursday is. And I don't know about you. I grew up in Chicago. It was almost illegal not to be Irish. <laughs> Mayor Richard Day J. Daly made sure of that. <laughs> um, so I had a problem. My family is Scots-Irish. So I had to wear orange as well as green. But literally, pinching on, on St. Patrick's Day was a part of going to school, right? Anyone have that? You get pinched on St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. If you didn't wear your green. Now, that's from the leprechauns. The leprechauns are the ones who pinch, you know. I don't know why people thought people had to pinch. <laughs> Any Irish here? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. And most of us are Irish in our hearts anyway, right? <laughs> Anyone been to Ireland? Oh, my goodness, the air. Good, good, good. They're beautiful. Oregon's a lot like Ireland, isn't it? Yeah. I had an amazing experience. I was driving across country a couple years back, and I, I, at Topeka, I took a side route and went along a river valley, and I thought I was in Ireland, in Kansas. That was so weird. But it was this pretty little green valley, and all the houses and all the walls were rock. And there were trees in appropriate places in Kansas. Very strange. Well, part of why we love Ireland is it's the sort of the last holdout of the people who avoided being Romanized. And the Roman Empire is still in full force. We call it America. Um, but... <laughs> What what you know, what happened was the Irish managed to avoid being taken over and governed by the Roman Empire and then the Roman Church. And their hero, the one who made that happen, was this guy we call Patrick. And I've always thought it was strange. Have you ever known an Irish Gaelic name anything like Patrick? I mean, Seamus and all these other names. No, Patrick. That's not Gaelic. That's not Celtic. It's not from Air. Okay? It's Latin. And it means patrician. We talked about patrician last night, the Dons and I. All right? Patricians. The, the, the upper caste, the voting class of the Roman culture. It turns out that this young boy's parents were governors of Scotland. They were Roman patricians. Isn't that interesting? So when he went to Ireland, he went as the patrician, the one who was going to be managing Ireland for Rome. However, an interesting experience prevented that from becoming what Rome had in mind. And some of it has to do with timing. And I know some of you get bored with my history, but you know, context is so helpful, <laughs> you know. When it's just this idea out here, it's really hard to bring it in and have it be part of our spiritual process, much less our intellectual process. So let's look at when this happened. This little boy whose real name was Maven Sokol, <laughs> or Man, <laughs> he might have been called Man, M-A-E-W-I-N, Maven, okay? This little boy grew up in Scotland as the son of these very rich governors. Well, it was in 387 when he was born. Anyone remember 325 is that key year? That's when Rome became Christian. 325 is when Constantine said, okay, everybody, I'm not going to be in Rome anymore, so we aren't going to be centered on the Temple of Jupiter, and I'm not going to be your God. I'm going to let this Christian God be your God, and I'm going to put all those little bishops who have been running little household churches in that main temple in Rome, and they're going to hold this empire together. 325. So this guy that we call Patrick was born in the really the first full generation after that. Kind of like Ralph Waldo Emerson was in the first full generation of Americans, people who were born in America. Okay, So Patrick was the first generation to be born in the Christian Roman Empire. 
That's got to have had a huge impact, yeah? And it turns out that just as had been the case during the pre-Christian Roman Empire, if you were going to be running anything in the empire, you had to be high in the temple. You had to be high in the church. So his father who was merely part of the family, sort of the lieutenant governor, was a deacon in the Christian church, and his grandfather, ah, he was the guy in charge. He was the priest in Scotland, a Roman priest in Scotland running Scotland for the Romans, to the point to the extent that the Romans were willing to be occupying Scotland. You may have heard of Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> right? Okay, so... Here's this kid growing up in an ostensibly Christian family, early, early, early church. So he has this habit or this awareness of what the Gospels say because the Bible has been established, 325, the canon was established, the Apostles' Creed was being said, communion was done regularly. Okay, Well, there was this island across the Irish Sea <laughs> called Ayr, and they were not happy with the Romans in the area, and they would periodically go raiding the Britain, Scotland, Roman territories. And so basically pirates. They would come over and they would just you know, hit a village or hit a, a territory and burn houses and steal things and whatever, and they stole away the 16-year-old boy. Yeah, among other people. And they put him in a situation where basically he was a shepherd in the hills all by himself for the next six plus years. So here's a kid, grew up in this marvelous situation of you know, wealth and stature and power and with a, a Christian, you know, lots of prayer, lots of um, services, regular services because that was part of their job. <sighs> and he's alone in the wilderness. But he has a role model for being alone in the wilderness with a sheep, yeah? We have it in the Old Testament. David. So he identifies himself very clearly with David. A boy alone in the wilderness with a sheep. And the Psalms of David, many of which were written during that time, the Lord is my shepherd. I lift my eyes up into the hills whence cometh my health. Those became his his litany, his mantras, and he began to pray. And he says in one of his letters, he, we have two pieces of documents that are actually his, and one is called Confessio, and this is him saying, this is who I am, this is what I've done. He said, I was praying as many as a hundred times a day and a hundred times a night, staying in touch with the Lord, staying connected with the Lord. So he built this relationship with divinity when he was a slave to the Irish families we don't know exactly where we don't know exactly who but he was called a servant boy and he was expected to do all of the work of that particular location and he learned Gaelic he learned to speak you know the Irish language at the time and he began to connect with the people you know, he's 16. He's there for about six years. And one day he has a vision. And his vision, in his vision, an angel of the Lord comes to him and says, it's time for you to leave. If you will walk this direction, which happened to be east, you will come to a ship and that ship will take you home. So he walked 200 miles, according to his letter, and found the ship and it took him home. So he got away. And he went back to Scotland and back to his family, and he was there for a little while. But he had another vision. And in this vision, he said a man came to him with a lot of letters, and the man's name was Victorianus. Victory, right? And in one of the letters, there was a message. And it said, among other things, Please, holy servant boy, Come back and teach us. Come back and teach us. Well, he didn't feel like a holy servant boy, and he certainly didn't feel capable of teaching, 
And because he had spent the years that he would normally have spent in college, the equivalent of college and ministry school, sh tending sheep, he had to go and do that as an adult. And he went to study with a guy at the French town of Auxerre, whose name is Germanus in Latin, Saint-Germain in our awareness. And he studied with him for over a dozen years to learn how to be a priest in the Roman Church. Now, anyone hear of Saint Germain? <laughs> yeah, this was a very powerful guy. I mean, this guy is so powerful that he is said to have showed up a thousand years later in Europe and 200 years later than that in Europe. I mean, he is like the... the, the, the um, Western mystical Babaji. If you know about Babaji in the Hindu tradition, Saint Germain is ours. Okay, he's a guy who learned to not be stuck in a body, and to take on whatever role was necessary. Some people even think Francis Bacon is really Saint Germain. <laughs> I think that's interesting, and that he actually then he left that body and went and founded the Rosicrucians. So <laughs> who knows? <laughs> But he is that being. So Germanus is this incredibly powerful being who has tapped into spiritual power in a way that most people did not understand and certainly was not the sort of thing that a little, you know, that even the governor of Scotland would understand as a priest because that was a formal appointment. Now I need to tell you that we're not used to having church and state together. We can be in this room because we don't have church and state tied together. But in the Roman period, you couldn't be a leader of anything unless you were a leader in the temple. And in the pre-Roman period, for thousands of years, no man could come into power unless he was married to the highest woman in power the high priestess of the church. Julius Caesar couldn't become Caesar until he married the priestess at the Temple of Minerva, Hera, whatever name you want to use. Okay? Claudius couldn't become emperor until he married that priestess. When you see High Claudius, and he thinks he's, you know, that we're presented in that movie, High Claudius, that he married a prostitute. No, 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 no. <laughs> In, in Hebrew especially, and sometimes in Greek, the, the same word for prostitute and female in masculine is temple devotee. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. We have kind of a twisted view of what women have done in our culture. Yes, yeah, so these are women who are high in the temple. And so you couldn't become a leader unless you were actively in the church, masculine and feminine power positions, okay? And that you can even see that as you follow the papacy, that different men became popes because they were their sons of or married to, yes, married to the right woman who was of the right lineage and had the spiritual power. So that's the world that, that this kid grew up in, okay? So, but he becomes a celibate monk, maybe. Maybe. Celibacy was not normal until the 1400s. Still not normal. <laughs> you didn't hear that. She said still not normal. <laughs> right. <laughs> In the 1200s, co-ed monasteries and married priests were normal. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And we're talking the three and four hundreds. So, different world. Let go of the assumptions. Let go of them. All right? Now, we were all taught stories about Patrick, and I'm going to explain some of them. But, you know, here's this guy who had this incredible set of opportunities and grew up in a world that we don't even begin to understand. We do not get anything about that world. We need to get that, all right? Except that they did get up in the morning and they did eat something and they did go to sleep at night. We have no idea beyond that. <laughs> we know that some people were warlike. We know that the Celts tended to train their people, their men, in using military 
you know, capabilities, having military capabilities. And we know that the Romans trained certain men to do that, but not every man. That's about all we know. Isn't that interesting? So let's let go of our preconceptions. The kid goes and he studies with St. Germain, Germanus. And he begins to develop some of these powers and these abilities. And his teacher happens to be a friend of the Pope. Germanus, being a very powerful person, can get pretty much whatever he wants. (laughs) So he tells the Pope, I think this boy should go back to Ireland. He speaks Irish. (laughs) We should send him there. And the Pope said, yeah, well, we have this other guy in line, so we're going to send him first. And that guy lasted about two years. His name is Palladius. He lasted about two years before he died. And so then it was our kid's turn. And the Pope said, we're going to send a patrician to Ireland? Are you kidding me? All right. He is the patrician in Ireland. He's not a missionary. He is now in charge. Patrick the patrician so he's no longer brother maven or father maven he is now Patrick the archbishop of air in a world where the local men are going to fight anything (laughs) even if they're druids they're going to use their power and the local women are empowered that's one of the things about Celtic culture that's a little different from late Roman culture. By the empire, the only place a woman had power was in her home or in the temple. In the Celtic world, every woman has power because it's recognized that the power of the divine feminine comes through every woman. So in the Celtic culture, every man has power, the divine masculine and the physical form, in, and every woman has power, the divine feminine. All right? So we're going to be looking at that realization of empowerment that we call, in the Unitarian tradition, the inherent worth and dignity of every individual. Wow. Growing up in a culture where everyone is considered worthwhile. Doesn't matter what color or what gender, whether one is a warrior or a priest, whether one feels a direct connection with the divinity or is struggling to find that, everyone has worth and dignity. And that was what made this man beloved. Because he understood that. In the Roman tradition, only patricians had worth and dignity. Everybody else didn't count. If you were a citizen, you were entitled to certain rights. Paul demonstrated that in his experiences. But you still couldn't do much. Okay, A patrician had all the power. And virtually everyone else was a slave (laughs) or an indentured servant or something like that. No power. But in the Celtic tradition, everyone has power. So this young man is sent by Pope Celestine to Ireland. Finally, the the vision is fulfilled and the holy servant boy returns home. And, of course, the very first thing that happens is a power struggle (laughs) because they have to prove to each other that he has the right to come in and demonstrate power, right? Now, I'm going to be showing you a video, let's see if I can do this right, that has nothing to do with Patrick. (laughs) What it has to do with is the power that Patrick was using. I'm going to turn on my mic now. Can you hear me okay if I'm over here? Mm-hmm. All right. So we have this man. This is Lama Dorje. Lama Dorje is incredible. He is uh, one of these lamas who 
is born remembering what he learned in previous lifetimes. But he's in Tibet under Chinese rule. And so this is the Chinese internal martial arts demonstration. Internal martial arts. Isn't that interesting? And he's called Dr. Jung. All right? So he's figured out how to make things work. He knows, he is doing a demonstration, as you see, of the Heart Sutra. This is a Buddhist tradition. The Heart Sutra. It was funny. I found this video while I was preparing for this talk totally unrelated because I had just picked up a copy of the Heart Sutra. <laughs> and I went, oh my goodness, here's a demonstration of the Heart Sutra. Oh my, how does that work? <laughs> All right? So what this young man is doing is demonstrating how Patrick won the very first battle. To all forms of human suffering, on this film you are about to see is a condensed presentation of the original program given by Lama. We don't need to hear the sound. I'll turn that off. This is how Patrick won that first battle. All right. Do you want to see that again? <laughs> what Lama Dorje says about this, this is a, a triple black belt karate expert. He's been asked to come at him full force with every intention of hitting him. Well, this is real. This is real. <coughs> right. He says, his lecture starts with, if I were to fight him, if I saw him as a rival, let's see if I can get a little bit of that. There we go. <coughs> can you read that? talking about patterns, you don't enjoy it, you don't take notice of it. So he's explaining how not to be negative. That's when you become unhappy because everything is a rivalry. Okay. That's the old idea. So he's explaining the Heart Sutra. Where I want to go is, there we go, no, he's saying in rivalry you're constantly acting against what you truly want. Here he's explaining. This is normal. This is what normally we're trained to do. Water, whenever you put anything in water, 
water remembers it so that every drop of water has that in it. And he's telling us that's how everything is. If I insist that I am a separate being, then I have to be in rivalry. We have to have boundaries. But if I realize we are all the same molecules of water, right, we're all in the slightly different molecules but in the same glass of water, then there is a sameness, isn't there? So this Lama in Chinese Tibet is being what the man we call Patrick was being in Ireland. He is saying, I am not different from you. We are the same. We are all aspects of the same. And so he's able to show up without the rivalry, without that boundary, and it leads to an uh, you know, entirely different kind of experience. Do you want a little more of this video? Okay. You know, the point is not what the duck. You can have any type of the war, and every time I want to that up. What it means is, he touched me, and not only just separate here, but I thought it was him. Okay. Because I become him, I can play with his energy. That is what he is doing. And in the video, the guy goes on and he explains how weird it is. Because he has all this full intention, he gets that close, and his body is doing what he doesn't intend. <laughs> and there's times there where he's jumping and he's doing all kinds of weird things. He's flipping, he's landing on the floor. Yeah, triple black belt karate. This is not a, an amateur, right? <laughs> and this is how Patrick converted the Irish. The very first chieftain comes up to him, Dicha. And Dicha comes with the sword. And he cannot move his arm to hit Patrick until he gets that we are one and then he can put his arm down. And in return, he gives Patrick everything he needs, which is, to begin with, a large barn, a hall, a meeting hall. And so now there is a place for people to hear what Patrick has to say, and there is a hearing, because he's demonstrated he is not overpowered by the masculine power of the island. Isn't that wonderful? There's a line in here. He says, bully? Where are the bullies? What bullies? As long as I see it as a rivalry, as long as I see them as out there against me, I have bullies in my world. But as soon as I recognize we are all the same water, as soon as the energy that that being is, is the same energy I am. I can play with his energy, <laughs> says Lama Dorje. I can play with the energy. This is why I wanted to talk about this guy now. We have it, the same thing happening in Tibet and China as Patrick was happening in Ireland and Scotland and Rome and as we are seeing in our political sphere right now and in our schools right now. We have reached that stage in culture where bullying is normal. It's a stage. It's just like when kids are growing up. You know, when they're 9 and 10 is when bullying happens usually, yeah? And sometimes all the way to 13, 14 for girls. And then it's usually over. But we did not grow that, right? The culture is at that stage, American culture. We've been teenagers for a long time. <laughs> All right. So what we need to understand is this is just growing up. We are all the same energy. Bully, what bullies? Chieftain, what chieftain? We're all the same. And so what this man we call Patrick was able to do, Patricius, the Archbishop of Ireland, he was able to engage noble women to create wonderful nunneries, 
places where women could be in spiritual sanctuary, in a culture where women were part of the culture and involved in everything, the idea of being separated was unusual. But he was able to do it so that they felt they were able to continue to do, have a sense of power and able to do what they needed to do. And all of his churches included a convent. Every single one of them. I think he took a lesson from Paul there. <laughs> so were those the first um, Christian convents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we go ahead and look at Ireland today, and we, had, you know, every every Irish person identifies with Patrick, right? <laughs> Whether they're Protestant or Christian <laughs> or, or Catholic. Is there a difference? <laughs> Protestant or Catholic. Patrick is the guy. And he is the guy because he embodies the power of being who and what we can be all together. Not isolated individuals. And that's what allowed Irish Catholicism to be totally different from any other form of Catholicism for years. It wasn't until the Dominicans came in and started saying, no, you've got to do it our way. They're the Inquisition guys. <laughs> that Irish Catholicism was anything but loving and supportive and resurrection focused. Okay? Yeah. And it's what allows us allowed Celtic culture to survive instead of becoming the Roman Empire. Isn't that interesting? So what are we going to take away from this? Recognizing not only the inherent worth of every individual, which was part of the Celtic, but recognizing that every individual is a grain of salt and salt water dissolved into the water or a drop in the ocean. Right? And that it's all the same energy. And the Heart Sutra says that energy comes from the heart. Right? It's a loving energy. It's an accepting energy. It's a connected energy. It is one and the same through the heart. So I've gone over time. <laughs> we spent too much time on the video. But I really, really, really hope that you are beginning to get what it is that we can learn from Patrick that's far more than wearing green and knowing that the shamrock stands for Trinity. Oh, by the way, shamrock is a Persian word. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? Uh, same thing. It's, a, it's the same leaf, same plant. Well, tell us about your four workshops coming up. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, you know, those of you who haven't seen the flyer back there, I'm, I am doing a series of workshops called The Spiritual Science. And it, one of the things it does is explain how this guy is doing what he's doing, what it takes, and what, what we understand, what we know for sure, is given specific conditions, you always get specific results. It is a science. And it's called spiritual because it is using this other kind of power, not the physical, <laughs> right? Thank you very much.